The United States was not born with political parties, but political parties developed very quickly after the launch of the new government under the Constitution of 1787 and ratified in 1789. The framers of the Constitution did not like political parties. They hoped that their country would be spared political parties. They identified political parties as the bane of the existence of politics in Britain. And Britain, this was shortly after the American Revolutionary War, was where all bad things happened. And the United States, the United States should do just the opposite of what Britain did. And therefore, the United States should avoid political parties, should do whatever it could to make sure that political parties did not develop. Why? Because political parties in the minds of the framers, political parties in the minds of many people even today, political parties are these permanent organizations of individuals, starting with elected officials and, and the politicians themselves, but their supporters as well, who have a strong temptation, indeed they even have a tendency, to put the interests of the party ahead of the interests of the country. The framers of the Constitution thought that parties, the existence of parties, the partisanship that came from parties, would scuttle a republic. They believed that a republic depended on the civic virtue of the people, and parties would simply get in the way. Well, that was what they hoped. Within five years of the inauguration of the new government under the Constitution, parties had developed, and this country has had parties ever since. There have been two, excuse me, three, three two-party political systems. The first party system involved the Republicans, the Jeffersonian Republicans. Uh, these would evolve into the Democrats, but they were called the Republicans in Jefferson's day against the Federalists of Alexander Hamilton. And the Republicans versus the Federalists, this lasted from the 1790s into the 1810s. There was a hi hiatus, a break in the 1820s when the, the Federalists disintegrated and they didn't re- gather. They didn't coalesce into a new party, the Whigs, until the 1830s. At that point, it was the Democrats. The Jeffersonian Republicans had switched names and come up with the Democrats. So it was the Democrats against the Whigs from the 1830s to the 1850s. Then the Whigs fell apart under the strains of the sectional divide. And a new party replaced the Whigs. The new party took its name from Jefferson's old party, the Republicans. So the Republican Party, this was the Federalists, the Whigs became the Republicans, and the Jeffersonian Republicans became the Republic. They were the Republicans, and they became the Democrats. And the Republicans and the Democrats have squared off ever since. So we are still in the third party system in American politics. And one of the striking features of American party politics has been that the two parties have almost always been quite competitive. So they've been closely matched. Rarely does one party run away with things for a long period of time. In fact, in American politics, it's rare for one party or the other to gain you know, a huge victory in any single election. If you look at presidential elections, and this is the best way of gauging the, the influence, the power of parties nationally, presidential elections never, essentially, well, basically never, show a popular majority, look at the popular vote, a popular majority of more than 60%, maybe 60 point something percent for the winner against 39 or 40 percent for the loser. So it's a landslide if a presidential candidate gets 59, 60 percent of the vote. Well, think about that for a minute. You only get six votes out of 10, and the loser gets 40. I have to give you an example of how this plays out. In 1964, in 1964, the Democratic candidate, Lyndon Johnson, won in a landslide over the Republican candidate, Barry Goldwater. Johnson got 60 percent of the vote. The liberal candidate got 60 percent of the vote. The conservative candidate, Goldwater, got 40% of the vote. So it looks like the liberals, the Democrats, are running away with things. 20 years later, things had switched, flipped entirely. Ronald Reagan, the conservative candidate, got 60% of the vote. And the liberal candidate, Walter Mondale, got 40% of the vote. So in American politics, that's called a landslide. But think about it. Just two votes in 10 had switched. That's not, that's not uh, uh, like everybody going over to one side or the other. So keep this in mind because the point I'm going to make is there was a period, there was a period when one political party, the Republicans, dominated, dominated the presidency. 
and it was unusual, and this is why I'm going to be talking about it. It was, it was a period that started at the mid, actually, during the Civil War and lasted into the 1930s, so 70 years, 70 years between the 1860s and the, and the 1930s, in which the Republicans elected every president but two. So, to put it another way, the Democrats elected only two presidents between the 1860s and the 1930s. Now, that is a long run of Republican dominance, and it requires some explaining. But just to show you how it works in other times, the, since the 1930s, president, the two parties have basically rotated. So the, the Democrats had it during the 1930s and early 1940s, actually. So they got a boost from the, the four terms that uh, Franklin Roosevelt was elected for, but then the Republicans had it for eight years during the 1950s, and then the Democrats had it for eight years during the 1960s, then the Republicans had it for eight years during the early 1970s, then the, the, the Democrats had it for four years in the late 1970s, Jimmy Carter didn't get reelected, and then the Republicans had it for eight years under Ronald Reagan and then four more under the elder George Bush, then eight years of Democrats, eight years of Republicans under George W. Bush, eight years of Democrats under Barack Obama. And you know, we'll see where we are go after this as we get closer to the present. But in contrast to this flip back and forth, we have a situation where, in, during the period from the 1860s to the 1930s, where the Republicans dominated. And the question for any historian or student of history is, why was this so? And the answer the answer comes down to something the Democrats did to themselves. And it also has to do with the exceedingly sectional nature of the Democratic Party. In the decades, actually a couple of generations, three generations, four generations, after the, during and after the Civil War. So, a reminder of what happened. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was elected in 1860, a Republican. He was the first Republican candidate of the modern Republican Party to be elected president. And when he was elected president, Democrats, well, no, no, I shouldn't say Democrats, Southern Democrats said, he's not our president, and we don't want to have anything to do with him. And 11 Southern states dominated by Democrats because the Republican Party had no presence in the South during this period. And this because the Republican Party was an avowedly anti-slavery party. Now, there were people in the South who were opposed to slavery, namely the slaves, but they were not included in political life. They, were, they didn't get to vote, so their opinions didn't count. So among Southern whites, the Republican Party was anathema, was this horrible thing that had to be opposed. And you couldn't, essentially, you couldn't campaign as a Republican in the South during the Civil War, you'd probably get beaten up. There were no Republican newspapers in the South because the, the printing presses would have been trashed and thrown in the river. So the South was exceedingly intolerant of the Republican Party during the Civil War. And it, it the, got in this condition was aggravated by the fact that the South seceded under Democratic guidance and the North under the Republican guidance of Abraham Lincoln refused to let the South go. And the Civil War came, and the Civil War was seen by Southerners, white Southerners, as both North against South, but also as Republicans against the Democrats, because that's the way things lined up. Now, I have to say that there were still plenty of Northern Democrats, and Northern Democrats were, for the most part, in favor of the war against the South, but not entirely. There were, there were some Northern Copperheads, as they were called, Northern sympathizers with the South. And it was partly for partisan political reasons. They didn't want to hand everything over to the Republicans. But this was, but so the two parties worked, um, there were still two parties in the North, but there's only one party in the South. Okay. And when the South lost the Civil War, and when white Southerners were compelled, white Southern slaveholders were compelled to give up their slaves, they felt that they had been misused. They felt that they had been oppressed by the North, but especially by the Republican Party. So memories of the Civil War, and in the South it was often called the War Between the States or the War of Northern Aggression or something like that. Southerners, uh, white Southerners were, for the most part, unrepentant about the Civil War. They didn't like the fact that they had lost. They didn't think they had done anything wrong. They simply had lost. They had been pounded into submission. And furthermore, 
the North was, and the Republican Party was the party that had freed the slaves. Now, most Southerners had come to terms with the idea, of, more, most white Southerners, excuse me, most white Southerners had come to terms with the idea of slavery. Some of them considered a necessary evil. Some of them considered it a good thing. They made apologies for slavery, saying slavery was good for the slaves as well as for the slave masters. Um, but, um, you know, they, they probably could have, I mean, at least some of them, many of them, could have come to terms with the fact that slavery was this institution that was being bypassed by history. But, but, the emancipation of the slaves basically, well did, deprive slaveholders of, in most cases, their largest source of wealth because ownership in slaves and uh, white planters in the South and even small farmers and people who lived in the cities who had slaves, in most cases, that was their largest asset. It would be very much, just in terms of the property and the, the wealth that was lost, that was confiscated as they saw it, it would be the equivalent today, just in terms of the reaction on economic grounds, as if the, the government came in and said to all Texas homeowners, okay, we're taking away your home. And by the way, you're not getting paid anything for it. So there would be this economic grudge to go along with all this other stuff. Anyway, so what white Southerners, and they're all Democrats for this reason, they're holding a grudge against the Republicans. They do what they can, not all of them, but many of them do what they can to restore their privileged position after the Civil War. Even under the strain of having lost their slaves, and having lost the Civil War. Now, this wasn't easy to do. In fact, they tried to do it too quickly for their own good, and Republicans in Congress reacted by saying, wait a minute, no, we're not gonna let you just waltz in and take over positions again. And Congress imposed rules about Reconstruction. And these rules were just, and they were enforced with soldiers, with military rule, and they were designed to make sure that the freed men, the, the former slaves, men and women, that the, the former slaves were given something approaching political equality, that were given the vote, for example, and, and they were given the vote by the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. So on paper, former slaves, African Americans in the South, had the vote, and this meant if this were allowed to continue, this meant that the white elites who had run the southern states before the Civil War would find their control jeopardized, if not eliminated entirely. And furthermore, and furthermore, uh, well, so imagine that you were a former slave and you were given an opportunity to participate in politics. And as I say, the party, party politics is strong in America. You would have to choose a party. Which party would you choose? Well, you wouldn't choose the Democrats. These, this was the party that of people that had oppressed you. This was the party of people that still didn't like the idea that you were no longer slaves. You would naturally gravitate toward the party of Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator. And so during the period of Reconstruction, Southern blacks tended to vote Republican. And because many of those former slave owners and many Southern whites resented the very idea that the former slaves should be participating in politics at all, the fact that they were Republicans added to Southern white Democratic resentment of the Republican Party. So the Civil War and Reconstruction built this divide between Southern Democrats, all these white people, and the Republican Party. So, Reconstruction lasted a few years in some states, a decade in other states, but it eventually ended when Northerners, as a group, decided they had had enough of trying to reform the South and making the South act right. And yeah, most Northerners were thought that the former slaves, that blacks in the South should be able to participate in politics and they shouldn't be terrorized by guerrilla groups like the Ku Klux Klan. And they were willing for the federal government under Ulysses Grant to take measures to protect them. And Grant, in fact, went so far as to declare martial law in parts of the South and to bust up the Ku Klux, the Ku Klux Klan and send the Ku Klux Klan 
off in all directions. It wouldn't revive again until the 20th century. But Grant understood that in a democracy, in a republic, you can't govern using the army. You can use the army in extreme cases once or twice, but after that, things have to go back to politics. And so Northerners finally just gave up on the South and essentially returned control of Southern politics over to the white elites who had governed the South before the Civil War. Now, for the reasons that I explained, they're all Democrats, all these white Southerners, and they are deeply resentful of the North and of the Republican Party. So in the first place, oh, and furthermore, and this is where, this is where things kick in, with the end of Reconstruction and the withdrawal of federal support and federal troops for African Americans in the South, these white elites in the South find ways of disenfranchising Southern blacks who were supposed to be able to vote under the 15th Amendment. Sometimes they would use literacy tests where they would ask somebody to explain the third article of the Constitution, something that, by the way, this was not applied to white voters. It was only applied to potential black voters, and it was a nearly an impossible test. And then there were poll taxes. You had to pay to, to vote. And this obviously discriminated against the poor. And they were often combined with what were called grandfather clauses. And this would say that these provisions do not apply if your grandfather, or if you had a direct ancestor who voted in, oh, let's just pull an election out of the air, the election of 1860. Well, the election of 1860 was the last national election before the Emancipation Proclamation. So, although on paper they didn't discriminate on grounds of race, in practice they did. Anyway, the result of all of this was the Jim Crow system, the Jim Crow system of disenfranchising voters, black voters in the South, but it, it went from there into restoring, or I should say creating a system of segregation in the South. A system of segregation starting in uh, transportation accommodations, railroads, for example. The railroads were a place where segregation first set in. But then from railroads to restaurants, to churches, to schools, to theaters, to public lavatories, to all manner of places where people might actually rub shoulders, rub elbows in public if there weren't these laws keeping them separate. Now the idea was basically to show Southern blacks that they might no longer be slaves, but don't get any ideas that you're the equal of white folks. This Jim Crow system of segregation was given approval sort of, by the Supreme Court in 1896 in a landmark case called Plessy versus Ferguson. And the Supreme Court declared that the Constitution says that people shall not be deprived of equal treatment under the law, but it doesn't have to be together. So the formula was separate but equal. And by the way, this is often misunderstood because separate but equal on its face is not as objectionable as it later became. The thing that, because under the Constitution it doesn't say, I mean, for example, the, the supporters of the separate but equal doctrine say this is no different than saying that men and women shall have separate bathrooms. Okay? So, I mean, in, but in fact it was because anybody knew, and, and the dissenters on, in that Supreme Court decision said, look, anybody who thinks that if railway accommodations, for example, are separate in the South, or anybody who thinks that if schools are separate, black kids in one school, white kids in another school, anybody who thinks that they will remain equal for very long is deluding himself or herself. And, and that's exactly what happened. So, in South Africa, this regime of separation would be called apartheid. In America, it was called the Jim Crow system, or the system of segregation. Now, what does this have to do with politics? What does this have to do with electing presidents? Here's what it has to do. Northerners. Northerners disapproved of the Jim Crow system of segregation. They disapproved, but not enough to compel the South to do anything differently. And, and actually, it's not clear quite what they could have done because under America's federal system, schools, these are matters for states and localities to deal with, and laws about restaurants and laws about you know, who shall uh, 
be in what churches and churches. Actually, those are private congregations, so they can do what they want. There wasn't, there wasn't the legal system, nor for that matter, was there the legal sort of interpretation or culture that said that if somebody in Massachusetts or Nebraska thought that the Jim Crow system in Georgia or Mississippi was wrong, that there was really anything that that person in Massachusetts or Nebraska or California could do about it. So the domestic practices, the domestic institutions in American life were understood to be matters for the states to deal with. And once the old southern white elites had regained control of the state governments while well, they were going to pass the laws that they liked. So anyway, Northerners disapproved of this, but they didn't disapprove enough that they would pass, let's say, a constitutional amendment or even federal legislation trying to outlaw the Jim Crow system. They were kind of willing to let the Jim Crow system be. They didn't like it, but they weren't going to make the effort to change it. But, having said that, they didn't want to be reminded of it because, you know, this is not the way things are supposed to be in America. And so, for this reason, the South, the South was treated as this region apart. It was a different world. It was a different country. Now, not really a different country, but to all intents and purposes, a different country. Remember, we're talking about an age when people didn't travel as much as they would. So if you grew up in New Hampshire, odds were pretty strong you would never set foot in the American South. You, know, you probably didn't have any family that lived there. You didn't, probably didn't have any business dealings there. The economies of the South and the North, they weren't exactly separate, but they weren't very closely knit together. And so it was entirely possible for people in the North never to have any personal dealings or personal observation of the Jim Crow system. And, of course, this was in the day before television, so you couldn't see televised scenes of you know, people going to separate bathrooms or the signs that say, uh, colored only for this entrance into a theater or something like that. So, Northerners could largely ignore what was going on in the South. They didn't want to think about it because it didn't make their, their consciences, their consciences of American citizens feel good. Uh, but again, they're not going to do enough. They're, they're not so offended that they're going to do something bad. So, but they don't want to be reminded of it. And for this reason, the South, which is represented in large part by, well, the, the South is represented politically by the Democratic Party. And the so-called Solid South, Solidly Democratic South, became the stronghold, or at least one, a major part of the Democratic Party. And in, indeed, in the period from the 1860s until the 1930s, it was the home base of the Republican, excuse me, of the Democratic Party. Well, so this is why the country wouldn't vote for Democrats for president, because a Democrat most likely would be a Southerner, or at least would have had to make peace with the white supremacists who governed Southern politics, who ran the Democratic Party in the South. Any Democratic nominee, excuse, yeah, any Democratic presidential nominee would have to pass muster with the white supremacist South. And so that person would be somewhat tarnished, maybe really tarnished, in the minds of Northerners. And they didn't want to be reminded of the Jim Crow system in the South, so they wouldn't vote for him. Now, the Democratic Party caught on to this, and they just didn't bother nom well, they had they had to nominate somebody, but they never they didn't bother nominating any Southerners. That would make it even worse. The two cases, the two cases where the Democrats broke through this Republican wall, Republican presidents from the 1860s to the 1930s. Two exceptions. One exception was Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland was a New York Democrat, and there were enough, New York was the most populous state in the Union, therefore it had the most electoral votes. And the Republic, excuse me, the Democratic Party was, I said, it was strong in much of the, the North, but it, it was especially strong in New York, in parts of New York, New York City. And so Cleveland got the support of New York Democrats. Another thing was, one, something that happens very often when one party has been dominant for a while, 
is they, they get corrupt because they don't have this competitive check on them. And by the 1880s, the, the Republicans were notoriously corrupt and they nominated a candidate, James Blaine, in 1884, who was among the most notoriously corrupt. And so it was straightforward, not easy, but it was straightforward for Grover Cleveland, who had a reputation for stern honesty, to cast himself as the candidate of honest government against Blaine, the corrupt, well, Blaine, Blaine, James G. Blaine, the continental liar from the state of Maine. He was from Maine. That was the taunt of Blaine. So Cleveland wins. So he's the first of the breakthrough candidates. The second was Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson was a breakthrough only sort of half so. Woodrow Wilson was born in Virginia. He was born in Virginia before the Civil War. He grew up in Georgia. So he was a son of the South, but at almost first opportunity when he went to college, he went north, he went to New Jersey, he went to Princeton, and he spent his entire adult life in the north. He was elected president in 1912 while he was governor of New Jersey. So here was a southern boy who had become naturalized to the north, essentially. And so he got the nomination in 1912, but he, he only won. He only beat, uh, he got the Democratic nomination in 1912. He only beat the Republican candidate because the Republican Party split. In 1912, William Howard Taft was the Republican president, the incumbent Republican, but he was challenged for the nomination by Theodore Roosevelt, who had been off on a safari and come back and he wanted to get back into politics. And in a bitter primary and um, a campaign and the campaign leading up to the convention, Roosevelt peeled away a lot of the votes that would have gone to Taft. He didn't quite get the nomination, and when he didn't get the nomination, he bolted the party and ran as a third party candidate. And so, really, it was only this split in the Republican vote that allowed Woodrow Wilson to be elected. And so, Woodrow Wilson got elected. But the influence, the Southern influence, and although he had lived his entire adult life in the North, the Southern influence was really strong in his presidency. So Wilson, when looking for people to appoint to positions, looked to senior Democrats. And senior Democrats, well, the, the most senior Democrats were Southern Democrats. And because the South had come in behind Wilson, he had debts he owed to Southern Democrats. So Southern Democrats got positions in his cabinet, and Southern Democrats got leading positions in, on committees in Congress. And Wilson found himself, if he wanted to get any legislation through Congress, he had to make his peace with those Southern Democrats. And those Southern, Wilson was, himself was a Democrat, but not a Southerner, except long ago. He shared some of the prejudices of Southern Democrats, but not in as extreme form as many of the Southern Democrats. Wilson found himself in his first cabinet meeting, confronted with a request, actually more of a demand by his postmaster general, to segregate the postal services workforce. And Wilson Wilson wasn't in favor of segregation. He wasn't particularly opposed to it either. And as a practical politician, he realized that this very first test, he was going to have to give something to the South. So he acquiesced. He let segregation of the federal workforce take place. Now, Wilson did share some of the racialist, one could say racist thinking, of people of his times. But, so this is something worth keeping in mind. And, um, Wilson has come in for criticism uh, recently. His name was stripped from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy at Princeton for his racist thinking and his allowing or the segregating the federal workforce. But it's important to bear in mind that whatever you think of Woodrow Wilson, if he had not had those views, he never would have been president of the United States because he needed the support of Southerners. And if he had been a hardcore egalitarian, they would have said, forget it, you're never going to be president. Anyway, anyway, so Wilson is the second, of, second and the last of the Democratic presidents. The Republicans get back together, and in 1920, they win back the presidency. And so this Jim Crow system was one that secured 
democratic dominance in the South. But it deprived the Democrats of what would have been their usual percentage of wins at the presidential level. We'll see more about this because even though the Democrats start winning the presidency in the 1930s, the South doesn't re-enter the presidency until the 1960s.